Well, hello, hello there. What is going on, Glass Cannon Nation? It's me, your good buddy Joe, here with a first time ever show. Something that we've never done before. We're calling it the Delta Green Debrief. It's a little, uh, I don't know, a look back at the uh, operation and demo that we finished as we launched into Delta Green. Uh, I myself was very interested in getting a lot of this information out there to you guys. And uh, and we heard from a lot of people that had a lot of questions about Delta Green and what happened and everything. And they kept saying, when are we gonna get a debrief? I, somebody else came up with this name, not me. And uh, I heard that, that little Delta Green debrief idea and I was like, I love this idea. I want to give it a shot. And so I reached out to the guys and uh, and a bunch of guys were interested in coming out and talking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Matthew Capitacaza, Grant Berger and Skid Maher with us yeah. today. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, hello. Uh, thank you guys for, for hanging out. We're uh, we're just going to do a little, uh, I don't know, hour here, maybe hour and a half. We'll see how it goes. Uh, of talking all behind the scenes of this adventure. I sort of imagined it like, what if we got ever got a chance to actually sit down with Lavalley and pick apart Giant Slayer and ask him where this came from or where that came from or uh, what was written in the module, what wasn't written in the module, that kind of stuff. He would never do it, never in a million years. And so I was like, you know what, I'll do it with Delta Green and, uh, and we'll have some fun with it. And I think that hopefully one of the benefits that'll come out of it is anybody who is looking to play a little Delta Green or run a little Delta Green, you can look at some of the processes that went into uh, my first go at this game and and what I liked and what I didn't and and that kind of stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I just want to just give you a brief overview of what we have ahead here. Uh, we're going to start off. Well, you know, the other thing I should do is warn you right out of the gate that this is an, an, an after the season is over sort of thing. So, like, Spoilers abound in this. We were talking about every single thing, including lifting the veil on a lot of things that the players don't even know. And so there's uh, you have to listen to the Delta Green season before you listen to this, unless you don't care about that kind of thing. If you like getting everything spoiled and then doing kind of a prequel, uh, feel free. But this gives you an insight into uh, the workings of my mind as I did this. And then we'll also hopefully get a little insight into the players' minds uh, from their journey through this little operation. Uh, so first, we're going to go into some operational details. I'm going to talk about the transition from that original demo we did into uh, a separately written operation. And we'll uh, go into details about what those two things are. Then I just got a couple questions for uh, my guests here about their characters. And then uh, we'll talk about what's coming soon for Delta Green. Hopefully what's coming soon for us, fingers crossed. And then uh, more so what's coming soon for uh, Arc Dream Publishing and, and the next thing that's coming out for Delta Green, which I'm very excited to share with you uh, in this little recording. And then we're going to hit a QA and a and we'll, and we'll open it up to you guys. Uh, and for that, by the way, so we're live on uh, Twitch right now. For those of you that are watching us on Twitch, we're, we're, or for those of you that are listening after the fact, we are live streaming this. And so we do have uh, a guest chat that we can check for comments and questions and stuff like that. Uh, so hold off on your questions for right now. We'll get to those in a little bit. Another uh, method is that you can tweet questions at me right now. So I'm going to also monitor Twitter and, uh, and I'll hit some of those up in the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, so so that's the plan, and, uh, and I'm going to get right into it now because I want to get through this as quickly as possible so that we can get to a little Q&A and see what you guys want to chat about. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Arc Dream Publishing for uh, allowing us to, to do this. Uh, it really is very, very kind of them. I reached out immediately when we played, uh, after we played the first New Game Who Dis, and we were blown away by the system. And I thought, I, you know, I have to reach out to these guys and uh, and thank them for making an incredible game and then see what we could work on together to uh, help get the word out. And so they were awesome and very responsive about uh, a giveaway. They gave away a handler's guide and uh, whatchamacallit, a, um, the need to know, which is something that we'll also talk about today, which is the essentially the starter's guide or the... Um, starter set right for delta green it's all you need to get a, a game up and running on your own uh and so they they gave one of those away to our our listeners and uh, and then we gave away a book and so yeah all around it was just a really great experience so uh, i'd like to like to thank them without them none of this none of this happens and so they started off by uh writing this need to know guide this starter set which 
uh, at the conclusion of it, it's, it's just sort of a uh, a brief, really trimmed down summary of the rules to just get you up and started. Uh, it's written by uh, Shane Ivy and uh, what's his name, Brett. Kramer, Brett Kramer. And so uh, they put this guide together. And Brett Kramer, I think, with a little bit of help from Shane Ivey, is writing, uh, wrote what comes at the end of it, which is called uh, Last Things Last. So that was the first thing we played, fellas. Like, that was that demo adventure, clean out the apartment, and and then you get sent up upstate to Keene, New York. That is uh, from Last Things Last. And uh, and then we transition from that into the bulk of what we'll be talking about today, which is The Last Equation by Dennis Detweiler uh, and uh, you know also published by Arc Dream. So this operation is much chunkier than the original demo, but we put them together as kind of a campaign, which is something that is uh, very feasible to do with the way Delta Green operates. So um, yeah, so... I guess I want to start off talking about that transition because uh, finishing up last things last was kind of crazy. I, I didn't really expect it. Skid, you were not here for that because uh, we actually was pretty much purely motivated by your illness and inability to record. And so we had uh, we had to just jump in and try something. And so we 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 I did read in rocking and rolling. <laughs> you did read it. I accidentally because I was I was looking through the the core book and i just saw it and i was glancing over and i was was like oh that's what they're playing when i listened to it (laughs) so i knew what was going to happen yeah and to me it was the perfect starter adventure it was Mm -hmm. not too dangerous i mean it's dangerous it's deadly don't get me wrong you guys played it pretty well actually to keep yourselves alive but it's uh there isn't such a huge threat of not only death, but like what you get with last equation is a little more threat of like imprisonment (laughs) threat of the media exposing you. Uh, You know, there's a lot of like different threats that are piled on top of each other in the last equation. The first one is, you know, you're operating under the radar. I I think the biggest threat that you had before you met Marlene Bowman was the, uh, the old lady in the hallway that Roger Gumstone ran into kind of, I guess, finding out who you are or whatever. So, uh, yeah, there, it is a great way to, to ease people into it. Oh, the other fun fact about it is that it's, it is not written with a location. There is no location in it, which I really liked about that. They said, set this anywhere you want, set this in any, it could be in any, the apartment needs to be in any city and his mountain house or country house needs to be four hours from the city anywhere you know and so yeah so i said it in new york and then i picked keen new york because i knew that troy knew it really well because of lake placid because of always going back and forth to lake placid and i was like oh this will get them like in the zone they'll know like the exact roads to drive to get there and the uh just the vibe of the whole area and so i think that's one of the coolest things about it it's like if that's something you want to run for your friends it's like you could just pick your town, you know, you pick a neighborhood, you know, for where this house is and, uh, and just operate from there. That's something that I did when I, I was playing the Ghostbusters RPG that Samantha bought me another copy of for my birthday. As a kid, you know, the premise of the Ghostbusters RPG was you're setting up a new franchise of Ghostbusters in another city. Mm-hmm. And so there was, they set up a Ghostbusters franchise in Denver. So when we were playing everything, like I was using local landmarks and everything, it was it was great. It was the only RPG that I've ever played in my hometown, set in my hometown. Well, awesome. I think we talked about before being from Denver and Dallas, which are major cities, but not often featured in like Hollywood films or TV. Yeah. It's like so cool to see those show up there. And uh, yeah. well, you did have uh, like one major being able to show do that. in Dallas. I can't remember the name of it. Alt. What's it called? What was the name of that show in the '80s set in Dallas? Is it Nash Bridges? I, something like that. Oh I yeah, don't know. Called Nashville. I think that's the right. show. I think that Nashville. was Dallas. <laughs> oh, please, uh, please. Ignore. Home, we've lost Joe. Yes, please ignore my my video issues. Uh, oh you, my God, they got him. <laughs> Delta <laughs> Green got him. They didn't like him talking. They didn't want him to spill the secrets. <laughs> I'm gonna slowly bring it back in here. It's gonna be a disaster. We'll just be, oh, we'll just be sitting here, and all of a sudden, we'll listen to Joe just die. Whoa, oh god, whoa. his camera was all at a Dutch angle. Yeah, my camera I'll was all of a sudden like a, a like a mid '90s music video. 
My keyboard uh, has been infected by Delta Green as well, Joe, so don't uh, feel bad. Uh, I've gone uh, <laughs> full, full Delta Green for this. Experience. Which one is that, Grant? Is that the one you built yourself? Well, I didn't make the circuit board or anything, but I put in the switches. <laughs> and the You're soldering uh, the, the circuit board. <laughs> keyboard, uh, I'm soldering it. <laughs> Uh, so I had a blast with that with that adventure, and you guys did a, a great job of. Obviously, the character builds were so incredible. So, uh, Grant, we might have talked about this before on the FOD, but just give me the briefest overview of like where does Riker Salas come from? Where does this idea come from? Because to me, it was like the hit moment of the first three hour show was the introduction of Riker Salas, uh, and particularly his I his loadouts. So. <laughs> <laughs> deep, deep inspiration from hours and hours playing online Rainbow Six competitively with like Game, <laughs> Game Spy in like 1997 on my gateway computer. <laughs> and I played with these Marine veterans who were like, yeah, man, I killed all these people in the Suez Canal. And I was like 13 and like, yeah, my MSN password is this. Here's my mom's credit card. Um, but no. The thing about Rainbow Six and Tom Clancy novels in general is that they get super into gear. They get real about the ops okay. and how things work out. And, <laughs> and uh, that was definitely a big inspiration. Um, and then like the other half of it was just like procedurals and, and um, McNulty was probably a pretty big inspiration uh, from the wire, uh, the alcoholism that is in his life and that he struggles with and like McNulty? all those scenes. <laughs> no, Mick Nolte, oh, uh, oh. the character from, from Well, you from know, the Mick Nolte has had his own struggles with substance abuse, so. It's true. Uh, <laughs> you know, you really blew I'm the I'm just saying, on just open one. your horizons a little bit, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, just scenes of him and Bunk, like, looking over Baltimore with the sun rising after, like, they, like, you know, accidentally uh, uncovered some evidence they shouldn't have and just drinking, like, doers straight from the bottle was really what kind of inspired the other half of him outside of the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's I think that's a great thing about Delta Green. We've talked about this before, but just the how much inspiration you can get from the. Uh, the modern setting and the, uh, you know, with the fantasy setting, you're, you sort of always end up falling back on like, oh, it's Lord of the Rings or, or what, you know, you have kind of limited resources to pull from that are that are truly, really good. And uh, but in this case, it's like there are so many different sources that you can pull from. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that. Uh, that are are fantastic and are subtle and would you know in their own way kind of uh lend it, itself to a character that you think is you know i don't know completely original but really all it is is a, is a conglomeration of these uh great series or whatever that you watch or books that you read and and yeah i think that that was part of my preparation as well was reading procedural books and and going back to rewatch uh silence of the lambs and stuff like that just because i mean that is a little bit of the creepy and everything but like there's i was watching it for the fbi stuff i'm like all right who reports right. to who and what is the uh the dynamic between the young agent and the and the uh boss on the case all that kind of stuff you know trying to uh, you know capture all of that in the operation so um, it's kind of funny uh, by the way, uh, and when we talk about uh, another character later, I can talk a little bit about it, but it's actually somewhat difficult outside of a couple major films to find FBI like as the main character. It's much more often in television, I find. Um, so, uh, you know, you have Silence of the Lambs and some other FBI films, but for the most part, they're kind of like not the driving impetus behind a story. Maybe that's because of how secretive a lot of things are, but uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, are no. you unfamiliar with uh, cinematic masterpiece The Rock? <laughs> <laughs> That's a man, not a movie, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I think Troy's uh, Troy's character was the closest to being uh, unhinged Nicolas Cage at his finest. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I, I took great joy from some of Roger's uh, unhinged moments, especially at the foot of my bed as we went to sleep in that motel in the second adventure. <laughs> uh, yeah, when, I mean, when I went to to look into it, it like to find FBI-based like 
not like fiction uh, to read. It was actually sort of slim. I mean, there's a lot of Catherine Coulter stuff out there, like a ton. But like outside of that, it was basically nonfiction. It would be like the history of the FBI or like uh, a book that I had read maybe half of few years ago called Killers of the Flower Moon, which is oh, sort of about great. the start of the FBI. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of stuff, it wasn't really going to inform my Delta Green play. And and I was looking for fiction because I was looking for, you know, just the, the what goes on, you know, interior drama behind the scenes with the characters, all that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, let's get back to transitioning. So we finish up Last Things Last with... You guys, I mean, Marlene Bowman escapes from you in, into the woods, you know, not exactly what I'm expecting. And it's funny in retrospect how the other, uh, your, 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 the last equation ends in a similar way in that like, while there are a lot of things tied off, you did not completely complete your mission uh, in, that, in that scenario. You did not completely destroy, uh, you know, all evidence of the number. And so there's, something kind of lingering there too but to go back to um last things last my my challenge here was to connect uh marlene bowman being in the woods somewhere in key new york with the last equation which i did not need to uh place in new york it was in new york it was uh in new jersey and the NYPD and everything was involved and the New Jersey State Police was involved. So it's one of the reasons I picked this scenario. I think that and because we all really enjoy, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that we could all get behind like an academic-y sort of setting, going to yeah. Columbia University, the idea of the high, high level mathematics. Uh, I mean, I personally just had a good time researching Mersenne primes. <laughs> like they don't go into detail <laughs> about what they are in, in the module. Um, I had to look it up and I went down a wormhole reading about these guys. I mean, this is, this is nuts. Uh, what these people go through to try to find these, uh, ridiculously enormous numbers. But so, uh, I will say, and this is, this is by way of a reveal. I don't really know if there was any way to find this out. And it's kind of like, you ever read those, uh, adventure backgrounds for Pathfinder adventure and you're like, well, you know, the adventure background at a, a certain point in its history is so obscure that like the players can't really ever find this out like naturally through gameplay. Uh, and that's kind of where I, I ended up because I, I really wanted to connect the two, but I kept going back in time and back in time and back in time if I was going to make it happen. So, so the connection really comes around the time that, so when you spoke to the reanimated Francis Way, and Troy like calmed everything down and was like, just tell us what you want. There was a moment where he said he was Faustus Cloudon. And Troy was like, what? So Faustus Cloudon comes out of the module and everything that I, you guys found out about him is straight out of uh, the history of the, of the operation. And so one of the things that it said is that he traveled abroad and uh, went to these foreign places and I, think one of the names that was mentioned in there, I could be wrong, but was Southeast Asia. And so either it was mentioned or I just made it happen. And so my idea was Southeast Asia, to me, the only thing that I could connect was that Clyde Bowman was doing Delta Green work in Vietnam, in and around Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so I was, and so he does this crazy ritual to bring Marlene Bowman back to life. So I'm like, okay, what if we connect it through there? So. Faustus Clouding goes to wherever it was back, you know, whatever it was back then, whatever country it might have been back then. French and, Indochina. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, French, French Indochina. Indochina, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and it, you know, sort of comes across these people that teach him this ritual of, uh, you know, whatever it is. And in so doing, he summons this creature into himself basically so when it returns it is not him anymore but nobody really knows and then he just slowly dies but he still manages to publish this number after he's actually biologically dead but nobody knows this so his death is very mysterious in the operation you don't know really how it comes about so if you just simply connect those two things the next thing is you just have to get uh, him to be connected to the murders. And so uh, that's where I invent Francis Way, who lives in Keene. So, and, and it's just sort of like, uh, 
this is what the creature does. Like it hops from body to body, unless it's like dissipated through some sort of ritual. Uh, and in order for it to happen, they really just had to have a run in. And I'm like, well, sh- if she's running through the wild, maybe this guy's just like a hiker. You know what I mean? Maybe this guy is like obsessed with being out in the wild or did it, whatever. And then, uh, the bird watching bit all comes together because then you have the camera and you have the light, you know, who's out there taking pictures and everything. So in the, in the operation, what's actually there's like, so there was no, like Francis way was a character you invented all you invented yourself or is that? Yes. Yeah. Francis so way was a character supposed to happen or what, what are the parameters <sighs> for what you like what you, that you played with? Uh, what's actually supposed to happen. I mean, it's not really that much different. I mean, basically all I did with Francis way was like, he gave, uh, there's no description in the module as to where he makes the breakthrough besides saying he finds it in the last page of the book of many wonders. It's like he, something finally clicks. And when it clicks, he goes like off the deep end. And, uh, I just really used Francis Way to kind of give him the push. And so I was like, if Francis Way's name is in that email and they see Keen New York, now on, in our operation, in our story, this blows up into like a way bigger thing and everybody's going to go up to Keen New York and check it out and then there's going to be this dangerous encounter with the monster from a former thing. If you were to not take, let's take that all out. Let's say we just ran the last equation without the connection of the, uh, the creature that was... Um, inhabiting Marlene Bowman and then Francis Way, I believe what would happen is you would get much more into the effect of the number on the other people in the Math Geeks listserv. Because that is something that is a major, major situation. And you guys put out the APB through Delta Green, but then, um, you know, it says right in the operation, go ahead and... And, you know, if they ask about the international people, you get like this, like curt answer from Delta Green. That's just like, just worry about Americans. And like the, the, the phone hangs up. And uh, and so I thought it would be interesting to explore that a little bit more. But with the time it took, a lot of that had to get cut. And so that I put one a, in. Campaign. Sorry, go ahead, Skip. That could, a, that could be a whole mini campaign just going around the world, find, tracking these people down and shutting them down. Yeah, exactly. And so I kept thinking, like, how could we have one person like the one that I was really focusing on was Kelly, um, Kelly Castleman in Montana, because that to me was the most horrifying. Kelly Castleman in Montana um, gets this uh, this equation, solves it. She's a has a master's in mathematics. And she goes crazy and she's a school teacher and she goes in and shoots up her school. And so it's a real horrible situation, which was really the primary reason that I uh, did that big disclaimer in episode two now. But the first episode of Delta Green or the first episode of The Last Equation, I did that big disclaimer simply because I didn't know if we would get to that scene, which was very scary because if you don't like uh, put out the APB on her, in a certain amount of time it just happens and you like see it on the news so it's really kind of bad 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 and luckily you know you guys took care of it so i put that one scene in the epilogue just to show but there are numerous ones in the operation that can go down including uh one in modesto california where uh, a guy like burn just burns his house down with his whole family inside of it and they it it appears to be an accident and so like nobody in the press really knows but then you would know because his name was on the list you would know like something was going on but there are all different ways that you can get to these situations and you're welcome to go international if you can get the resources to do it and you have to make roles you have to make bureaucracy roles and all this kind of stuff uh to make it happen in fact As we came up towards the end, I thought maybe uh, they'll want to go to Belgium and and nix the the, like the original copy of this book that has the number in it, which is fully part of the adventure. It's not something that's like laid out in the operation as to how it's done. And by the time we got to the last episode, I was going to say, if anybody says it, I'm just going to like let them do it in a cutscene. So I had a separate cutscene written that was just like you guys taking care of it because you come up against no uh obstruction 
Like, they're, it's not difficult. They're not like, we highly protect this sacred book of our country. Like, you just go in, and then if you're sneaky enough, you can go back and just destroy the book, and nobody knows, because nobody cares about it. It's like this long-forgotten thing. And yeah. so, uh, but so you did we So if you hadn't merged the modules, and by the way, I thought that was pretty seamless, so nice work. Yeah. But like, so if you hadn't oh, merged you. the modules, it ends up being like the, the combat of the, of the operation is just like any any person who's seen the number losing their mind and you interacting with them? Yeah, pretty much. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything. That's pretty much it uh, in terms of combat. Really, the thing that you're up against, and what's one of the reasons I love the module, is I made it more about life and death and the supernatural. You definitely, any one of you could have if this went slightly differently in our version of the module, any one of you could have taken that shotgun blast from Kelly Castleman, like at her home or at the school. So like if you had somehow, if we didn't, if the Francis Wayne encounter was really fast or you never went there or it didn't work out, I was fully prepared to fly you to Montana. Um, and Skid, I even asked you to make a different character for a reason. And that was the reason. So this person oh. was based uh, out there and was doing, was ha like hacking into her computer. Cause you made a, a hacker essentially. Yeah. And so yeah. I, took that character and had them hacking into her computer and then he starts to put together the clues of what she's about to do based on like what her what she's searching for and stuff and so uh yes you could have taken a shotgun blast there and i mean one shotgun blast can kill you i mean it's 2d10 right. and so one blast could kill you but i think it was really more up against imprisonment like like 10 years in jail for impersonating a federal agent. So that's a big thing in the module is the the media and the FBI sort of following what you're doing and not stepping out of line with like the way you're supposed to do things. You guys were having so much fun that like I didn't want to bring the hammer down too hard and I knew that there was this other huge obstacle that was going to be life and death combat sort of situation that I was like, I'm going to shift to focus on this. And Skid, you did such an amazing job with uh, Jordy on diverting the media. So that character <laughs> is way more fleshed out in the operation. And I have an entire, this was one of the things I mentioned, Val, like, oh, this thing I'll never get to do. I had this entire scene written. I read an entire book about like investigative journalism and like the people that get in on the inside. It was a fiction, just a fun one. Uh, but you know, I, I'm a huge fan of like all the president's men and, and that kind of stuff. And, and oh, yeah, uh, fun fact for those at home, there is not a genre that Joe loves more. Not, I think he loves it more than fantasy than a newspaper movie. He, yes. He oh loves, God. <laughs> I'm a huge sucker for him. So, so I don't know if you guys know the poet, but uh, it was released in the mid '90s. It's a book by uh, Michael Connolly, who writes Bosch, and it's a different character, but he's a journalist following a serial killer. I read this many, many years ago. It's a very good book. He wrote a sequel to it, like 15 or 20 years later, and that's what I read uh, most of was that sequel. And so I had an entire like thing where this character like approaches Riker and he talks like about keeping certain things off the record and like he'll, he'll do whatever he needs to do to get the exclusive. He's going to lose his job, like you know. I, like the young guy is coming up behind him and going to take his like, you know, he's, he's a forgotten relic at the news channel and all this stuff. Like it was just going to, I thought, be a really fun character role play. And the way that you like the thing you came up with, I was like, there is no way that I can just like put this in here now as like an actual threat. Like, oh, let's no. just cross that off as like dealt with. Because the thing is, as he follows you more and more, it's like, do you trust him or do you not trust him? How would you tell him the truth or do you not? And then part of the challenge of the module is giving him the slip because then he, when you get into very serious stuff and he has his like producer, Chip is in the operation. Like his producer Chip. is in the operation because <laughs> Chip is like, he's on your ass too. So like even yeah. if if uh, uh, even if the reporter can't be there, um, you know, Chip will be following up on leads and like following you as well in different locations. And, and the idea is it's written in there. It's like just have them keep popping up in really inconvenient places uh, and make everybody squirm, which I think would have been really, really fun. But uh, you guys crushed that. And so uh, well, it's funny. Uh, we, we just moved came, on. That all came from Jordy's background as a newspaper guy exactly story. and it came it was inspired 
by i can't remember if i said this in the show but it, it was inspired the whole premise was inspired by me reading under the banner of heaven by john krakauer oh i love mm. that book yeah oh my so god that's, that's an that intense all, book yeah yeah um can, can i make a request though by the way since we're talking about missed opportunities if we ever go back to montana uh either whoever's running the game or if skid's playing in it we either need to feature a david letterman cameo or have skid <laughs> play actually play david letterman as a delta green operative oh my god <laughs> oh man you speak to my soul sir oh man <laughs> Um, yeah. So anyway, I think that it could have shaken out a lot of different ways, uh, in terms of what the tension is. Um, obviously once we connected the two modules, the tension was going to be resolving the Marlene Bowman storyline. Um, I give, uh, Arc Dream and Dennis Detweiler and Shane Ivey and Ben Kramer a lot of credit in the, the way that that demo is structured and the way that it's like the creature is very, very hard to beat. And so they really just have it designed to hurt you and then run away. Like that's sort of the idea of it is just to give you a taste. It's not supposed to just like level the entire party in that adventure. It's, its main objective is just to get away. And it does. It just gets away and and it's left open-ended. It says it right in the demo. It's like, you know, if, if it gets away, you just... It's up to you as the handler if you want to have another adventure where they have to find out how to find this thing or how to uh, get rid of this creature that's inhabiting this uh, corpse's body. And uh, and so we really didn't even do that either. We did something a little bit different. You know, we just sort of like delayed, delayed uh, its 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 mission for a little while. I also thought that it was kind of cool, this concept of like some sort of otherworldly supernatural being that was talking in a mathematical language so complex that for 500 years it was sitting in a book and nobody could understand it. And then this one kid cracked it and he thought a lot sooner, whatever he, it thought a lot sooner that somebody in the human race would crack it and start killing each other. Uh, oh my God, that brings me to the other thing, which is I can't even, so uh, man, I okay, I did forget something. You asked me, well, if Francis Way isn't there, then like the, the only real combat is like tracking down the other infected members of Math Geeks List Serve. No, <laughs> like the there's two. There's uh, Doctor Sarah Cummings, who you guys handled relatively well, but like if she sees that number or gets access to his email and his solution, in a matter of days she goes crazy and goes after you and starts like shooting everybody up in the FBI. And so there's that possible storyline. And then that intersects with what could have been, that could have been Jordy's storyline, which I actually talked to Skid about, about halfway through. Uh, it was, well, maybe a little less than halfway through, but it was right around the time that Skid, it was right after the episode where Jordy just like started spray painting over the number and got in the big fight and then the press was there and it was a whole, you know, that might've been the end of like the second episode, I think something like that. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, ah, after that episode. First or second, it was first or second episode. First or second. It, and it, I think it was the second episode because you guys had gone into the house first and had like looked at the family and stuff like that. And that's where you started to put together. Dr. Westover was a really big part of this too. Like, how all the numbers of the family connected to the number, their social security numbers, their license plate, their savings account number. It was super creepy. And Jordy started to get really bothered by it. And so he just went and started to destroy the number. To me, Skid was role playing, but it actually says if you have physics or math training, you're seriously in danger of being, uh, of succumbing to the full infection. And over a matter of days, if it is not prevented, you will go all the way downhill. And so I thought there was a real a world really in which Jordy could have snapped on you guys. But that story, which would have been great, it sort of got, I think, overtaken by the drama of um, the fight with Francis Way and Riker's death. Because at the time, Riker's like, he's putting Sarah Comox, he's off the case, off the you know, you guys have corrupted the number. You've destroyed the crime scene. You killed his email. So, like, she can't really get access to this stuff. She just thinks it's a frustrating, like, oh, I'll get it tomorrow or whatever. It's just a frustrating backlog. But you guys are actually saving her life. She doesn't really know that. Um, and then uh, Jordy is also kept out of the loop uh, in Colombia. 
So he doesn't see the book. He doesn't see any of his notes in his dorm room. And to me, like when you guys said Jordy stays at the NYP or at the local police with Riker, I was just like, damn, (laughs) damn, because I don't know if I said this. I don't think I said this on air. I told Skid this, but I don't know if I told you, Matthew or Grant. If Jordy gets the photocopy of the Book of Many Wonders and reads the crazy scrawlings in the back that are like on the last page where he has like solved this thing and the numbers in there and there's a bunch of like scrawlings. There's a whole bunch of equations uh, that are just sort of like jammed into the margins and Jordy with his skill would have read it and recognized a solution that is uh, the date, the current time that he's reading it is another number, his social security number, <laughs> and then it just says hello. Yeah, yeah. And so like it's a really oh, cool little thing that's meant, to, and then it's like sanity check, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, I think that, that's another another big part well, of it. Is like sorry, go ahead, Grant. One quick thing is that you're. One of the brilliant things that ended up working out really well for you as a handler is there was a time crunch with comics showing up, with needing to talk to the 24th Precinct, but also having uh, things still to do uh, by the crime scene in Jersey uh, and also Keene. So we probably never would have split up the party if we didn't have that time constraint on us, that pressure put on us from elsewhere. So you gain something with that, a sense of urgency by putting that into the campaign, but then you lose the chance for the party to move everywhere together and for Jordy to encounter that thing. Um, but I think you get uh, six of one, half dozen of another, uh, not in a bad way, but like they're both very interesting kind of setups. But, you, you know, yeah. all possibilities I mean, begin to winnow down after a while. Yeah. And if you think about it, there really were a lot of major decisions that that affected. And I mean, I think it directly impacted like the way that it was handled at the local police for you guys to get rid of those numbers wasn't just Riker. Like Jordy was a big part of making that happen. He had to talk Riker out of something, which was like not destroying the number yet. I can't remember what you were going to do, Grant, but you said something about like, oh, maybe we just send this to the FBI and blah, blah, blah. And Jordy was the one who was like, sort of obsessively like we need to destroy every single every single evidence of this number as as quick as possible so it's a good thing he was there and then that's where he does the whole media thing too and throws them off the case was there if he got to columbia got distracted by that he might have a started going crazy and b at that time not thought about the media anymore and and then like all of a sudden you might have the media all over you and uh so yeah i think that there's a lot of really good story stuff came out of it uh, like you said, six of one, half dozen of another. It was great both ways. But so, is there um, supposed to be like a reg- a real possibility that the party turns on itself and and starts like one of the party starts attacking the others? Well, there's two options. You have the option to make that a risk, or you have the option at the start of the operation to not make that a risk. And here's how they play it, which is like to me, I'm like, this is crazy. I've never played a game like this. Like, okay, I, I guess we could do this. It just says. If any of the characters has a 20% or higher in mathematics, they get a call from uh, their whatever contact, mysterious call, somebody who they don't know, maybe from Delta Green. And it says it just basically says. Do you have advanced training in physics or mathematics? And you ask the player what they what they say. And like, of course, they're going to say yes. Right. I mean, you would think because they don't know anything about the operation at this point, and they probably think you're calling them because they have that ability. If they say yes, the Delta Green agent says uh, you will not be needed. Goodbye. And just hangs up the phone, period. And the player has to make a new character on the spot for that for the last (laughs) equation, which is. By the way, I found an amazing resource online, which is someone put together like 180 pre-generated characters from all the different professions so like you could just snatch one out of there and like role play whatever but like there were pre-built characters just out there for like people to swap in and out i guess this game kills people constantly and that's why it's out there (laughs) so i got the (laughs) feeling of so uh it was nice to have that resource to kind of look at for inspiration yeah you just um, would kind of through that until you found someone with shit mathematics and then you're back on the case 
Yeah. Yeah. So that created a problem uh, in its own that I'll get to when, when I ask you guys a quick round of questions. So uh, I, th- I think we can get to that. Uh, I just want to mention one thing you guys didn't touch on at all, uh, which it's not necessary, but uh, the shooter's family. You never asked about his relatives or anybody you could contact through the university. That, uh, but his mother and his sister are characters uh, in the um, in the adventure, and it's not that they add a whole lot of new information, but it humanizes it in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. And the way that you guys sort of trashed him uh, in the press, I I didn't really have enough time. I would have to. I wanted. I needed to add another epilogue to show like how tragic that was. Like, because now the family sees this thing, and to me, I, I guess I mentioned it in in one of the banter openings of Delta Green, but that's what makes it an unsolved mystery. It's like, you know, the the interview in the living room with Michael Way's sister, you know, who is like, oh, I don't care what the media says. Like, there's no way, there's no way. He was never like that. He was never involved like that. He never, you know what I mean, whatever, whatever, uh, you could see that happening. We just didn't have time to play it out. But I thought that that was uh, kind of a cool additional thing that they had available to you to go in and check out. Um, yeah, I mean, otherwise, I think uh, I think that I that, just, that does. Sorry, I just love that we basically dismantled the actual, like a lot of the actual challenges of the of the module through bureaucracy and obfuscation. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, people could look at it and say, at least with the FBI agent aspect of it, that there's a lot of things that you did wrong, and I think a lot of that was just the way that you handled interpersonal communication, not so much the larger objectives, and. Uh, but there are so many things that you did incredibly well as FBI agents, which is like obfuscation <laughs> and misinformation and not telling people things, and just like keeping things, everything secret, whatever. Um, I think you did a great job. I think that uh, you could have, it could have gotten really ugly. Oh my God, I had a whole epilogue scene that I didn't get to do because Dr. Lyra Westover, I was watching everything you were doing. And in the final episode, you absolved, uh, Molly and uh, Anthony of all wrongdoing to the leader, the lead investigator, saying that that was a false lead and it didn't go anywhere and they don't have anything to do with this. He was a, he acted alone, all this stuff. I had an amazing, I thought, I was laughing out loud as I was writing it, epilogue scene of Molly and Anthony like making out in the dorm room to it, listening to the dark, dark side, side of the moon of and like the door blows off the hinges <laughs> as like the SWAT team comes in, pulls them off each other. She's screaming, they get handcuffed cuffed taken to prison all because Riker like on a whim was like yeah these guys are uh, in a their terrorist cell <laughs> no and I love that about the game in general and what it distinguishes itself from uh, Tolkien inspired high fantasy type of things is that you know orcs or whatever type of enemy you're going against in those are typically kind of one-dimensional characters um and everyone being not not always and not in a lot of adventures we play but oftentimes they are um and in this case it was like the real world consequences that affect humans who have all the foibles and virtues that humans do and seeing how the decisions we made could have a real awful impact on them, even though we're saving the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that that's the depth that this game offers, which is just really incredible. And uh, I don't know. I, I just I, I loved it. Uh, Topper Harley just mentioned something in the chat I saw about uh, that we needed a, an epilogue scene with those two in Guantanamo. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, it wasn't. I'm trying to find it here. The precinct. Yeah, it, it wasn't that far off. Did I did I end up deleting that? Uh, oh no no no. Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> it was cut to Molly Frank in a white interrogation room, <laughs> and uh, and we're just hearing like we don't see hear the sound from that. We just hear Pink Floyd playing in the background, <laughs> and uh, and there's just an agent just yelling in her face, and tears are streaming down her cheeks, and she's shaking her head, sobbing, just like and you know these decisions matter. And that's what I really wanted to capture there with the epilogue was that good and bad, every single thing you did mattered. It had repercussions. And, uh, and that's why I sort of left it all with 
the, the book still being there. You know, it's highly unlikely anything is going to come of it. Who knows? Maybe one day it will. But it is a loose end in, in our world of Delta Green. And I think it's a fun one to have out there. And something to me that gave me just that little touch of Indiana Jones, which I love so much. Like, there's just, you know, this this old ancient book in an old library in Europe that like is still there and could cause a problem if somebody doesn't go and get it. Uh, who knows? Maybe another operation for another day, which is one of the things, uh, <laughs> one of the many, many things I love about this. Uh, all right. We are. Sorry. To me. Did I not tell you guys that uh, in speaking of like the weird ways Delta Green like gets weird in real life? I, there was a, I'm not going to say who, but there was a character in this module who had the exact same name as a student of mine. A past student of mine. So fit, man. Really? And I was oh, like, when you, when you first mentioned their name, I was just, I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Well, I made up a fair share of names in here, so we'll see if it's one of the ones I made up after we go off air. Uh, speaking of which, we're, we're running late, so I'm going to keep it moving. And, uh, and you know, we're going to get to this Q&A, but I think we might lose Matthew in a little bit. So I'm going to jump right to Matthew. I just have a quick question. I think that you have done uh, a terrific job over the course of, uh, of the years and the programs on the network of uh, having haunted characters. But to me, this, this is one of your m more haunted, more troubled characters, even though it's a little more subtle. Would you agree with that? Dr. Westover? Yeah, I mean, yeah. she's literally got a, she literally has a psychological disorder that we, <laughs> on my character sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh but i mean compared to some of your other characters i mean compared to gormley or um uh i'm trying to think of who else um i don't know i just feel gormley. like gormley had her issues <laughs> right that's what i'm saying like gormley um uh Oh my God, what's Della's mom's name? It's been too long Metra. since Glass Cannon. Metra. Like, I mean, this is Metra, this is a person who has really, really awful background, and what she's dealing with now is really brutal. Where do you think Dr. Lyra Westover f fits in, in in that mix? Uh, is she holding it together uh, worse than them, better than them? And then uh, moving on from that, wh where do you think this operation leaves her at the end of this whole scenario? I mean, I think she's even more isolated and alone. I, I went, I, because we, the option I chose for between modules was go to therapy, but then you made me roll. You're like, didn't you make you, you, we, we played it up that like she had got that the Delta green knew about it and sent her a warning. So now yeah. she can't go to therapy. She's feeling she, <laughs> she lost right. her sanity. Like she had a full on uh, like sanity break in that, in the battle. And you know, She's got a rough relationship with everyone in her life at this point. Her father doesn't remember who she is. Her son hates her. Her, <laughs> her best friend slash medical school rival is uh, is started to question her ability to perform it on the perform on the job. I mean, I think she's going to feel incre increasingly isolated and uh, even more alone in this cosmically horrific world. <laughs> does you know, it's funny at the uh, time. She's got... sorry. Go ahead, Grant. At the time you got uh, penalized for seeing your psychiatrist, I made a point that like psychiatry is always a good thing. But I really like that tie-in because uh, someone uh, who listened wrote to me and said about Riker's alcoholism that he would have to dec disclose that to the FBI. There are psychiatric sheets that you have to fill out and you have to disclose all of these compromising conditions that might make you an ineffective agent. And I like the idea that Delta Green would be keeping tabs on it. And it makes sense considering what the paranormal does to people in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I think the the, you know, the life of service for an individual Delta Green agent is on average not very long. Um, and I don't know. Do you think that she would continue to do operations for Delta Green at this point? I think so, though. I wonder if Delta Green is going to want to rely on her. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as she gets increasingly paranoid, is she going to be useful as an operative or is she going to just be kind of a loose cannon? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I have to imagine, like, you know, if her sanity continues to degrade, is she get able to keep her job? I mean, she's a she works in an emergency room. It's a high stress environment. I can't imagine she's going to be able to, you know, keep a lid on it with no help from anyone whatsoever. Yeah. Unless she starts self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, gets and starts stealing prescriptions and yeah. uh, loses her license. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, let me kick it over to you, Grant. What did you feel? How did you feel about uh, the way things went down with Riker? 
I felt like it was great. I uh, had a full character arc. I appreciated the things that you picked up on without me asking to, uh, particularly with the seeds I planted about my mother. And at the very end, seeing uh, uh, Maxim at the baseball game was just uh, very satisfying to me, even though it was sad. Uh, and I actually got a chance, even though it wasn't necessary, because I, I felt like you did a really great job uh, summing up his character arc through those scenes. Uh, uh, I got to write an article. I was uh, very honored to be chosen to write something for No Direction. And I wrote up like what would have happened to Riker should that have happened. And that was a lot of fun to do. Um, I really loved Riker, but... Uh, so where do, where do people find that? They go to No Direction, but oh, where do they look up? Uh, they look up Bend the Knee. That's the article um, uh, series that is on there. And... Um, I, it's also on my Twitter. So if you go to twitter.com slash Grant Burger, scroll down a little bit, you'll see it. But um, I, 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 you know, there's some characters you want to play forever and inhabit for forever, but this was just such a solid character arc and like a really good journey for him um, that I'm, I'm not sad at all. And I love little things like, you know, you set up things for me too in terms of when we're driving to Keene for the first time when I got to talk about the picture of Maxim on my dashboard and yeah. talking to Rod all that and it was just it, it felt like a lived in pair of old shoes for whatever reason that character um, yeah but, even in a uh, short amount of time yeah yeah um, so i i loved it uh it, there was a scene in the motel six with roger cumstone where you had a pretty bleak outlook on what you were doing there and you know that you you didn't seem to have a to be very positive that you would make it out of there alive or that any of them or anybody would, at least whether it be this operation or Delta Green in general. Um, do you feel that either you or Riker sort of felt that, that this was coming? I think there was a degree of fatalism to Riker because his personal life had fallen apart already. Um, and he'd already, after years of being uh, a member of of counterterrorism at the FBI had been in life or death situations many times uh, and had had colleagues that had fallen and died in the line of duty around him. So um, I think because his personal life was on the precipice of total disaster and not being able to see his son again, uh, he was more willing to be cavalier with his life than he would have been had he had something substantive at home. But I think that's part of maybe why um, Delta Green may have found him in the beginning is because he had uh, a, an absence uh, of of space, uh, basically, to, that could be filled with Delta Green where that his family used to inhabit. So mm -hmm. I think he's ready. Uh, and I, I think uh, he thought that, and I think he thought he very well could die when he pulled Lyra out of uh, the uh, monster's hands. Yeah, that was pretty much it. That that pretty much did it. Uh, Skin, I'm going to kick it over to you for one, which is this is a complicated question because, uh, well, you and I talked a little bit more in depth about Jordy on Cannon Fodder just about a week and a half ago. And so uh, if you're a $10 subscriber on Patreon, you could find it on our uh, our post there. We went in a little detail about Jordy and how the, you know, his epilogue in a way, like how this has affected him. But I kind of wonder... I, I, with your physics background and the fact that you're like kind of famous, I think that it's kind of nonsense that you were even in the operation. I probably shouldn't have let you do it, but I got your character and I have to admit, like I was so taken with it, like the sci-fi author with the home in LA and the therapist in, in New York, whatever it was, the apartment in New York and the therapist in LA and everything. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and I was just so into it that I, I sort of fabricated this reason that they would send you, which was, you know, your background in newspaper and your ability to, to um, shape and craft story. Because that's one of the big challenges of the actual written module is like you have to give the media something digestible that they can take and, and run with and say like, oh, this is a thrilling story uh, that is makes sense. And we don't have to look into this any further. And I was like, oh, here's a perfect character to do that. But with your physics background and your recognizable face, probably wasn't a great idea, but we kind of we kind of jammed it in there. Uh, how did you feel about it? Were you frustrated that you were kind of jammed into that situation as a recognizable person undercover? Or, uh, you know, did you just kind of have fun with it? Yeah, in the moment I was like, well, what? Everyone's getting, I felt like everyone was getting mad at me for exposing the operation. It's like, what? People know your face? It's just like, you, motherfucker, you sent me on this fucking mission. Like, you knew I was famous. 
<laughs> like, don't get mad at me. <laughs> like I'm just here because you told me to be here, you know. But but no, but I thought it was for that reason, like even with that risk. I mean, it's like authors can be famous, but would you recognize one walking down the street? There's a handful, mm -hmm. right? You know what that's what that's what that was one of the first things I thought was like, take take a big ish sci-fi writer, not George R. R. Martin, but um, you know, no offense to anybody I mention here, but let's say like a Patrick Rothfuss and you put him on TV Our nemesis. to the general Our public, <laughs> like the vast amount of Americans are have no idea who he is with just seeing his face. Even many, many, many of his fans might not recognize who he is just looking at his face. So I was like, there's a chance Jordy could sneak, sneak this one by. Yeah. I was thinking. I always enjoyed the, I just enjoyed the observations. This reminds me of Imagine Dragons, which could be any group of five white guys walking down the street at any point. They're just so they, they make so much music and so many commercials, but like you would, you could not pick them out of a lineup. And that's the same thing. They could beat me up and I would have no idea. I have no idea. It's like, describe your assailants. It's like, I don't know. But that, well, I was thinking today about, uh, I have to Tom hop Wolf. off everyone, but this, thanks oh, for having okay. See you. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for coming by. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll do this again sometime after we do a whole new operation. A whole yeah. new operation. All right. Bye everybody. All right. See you buddy. But I was thinking, gonna, thinking about Tom Wolf, and it was like, I, I would recognize Tom Wolf, but only if he was wearing that fucking suit. Otherwise, I would have no idea who he was. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Uh, oh, I tried to switch to another screen, and it worked. Look at that. Really? Okay. Should be good. Should be good. Um, so, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for coming by. And I'm going to do real quick what's next for Delta Green, and then... We're going to open up to Q&A. Uh, so I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on two things. One, um, Arc Dream Publishing has just released to uh, its fans, essentially, uh, a new operation. And I've talked to the guys about this very, very briefly. Uh, and it's uh, they sent it my way, and I read it, and it's... <laughs> incredible and uh it's called px poker night it is uh, oh, available yeah. on drive through rpg uh right now you can go get it i don't think that it's in retailers in bookstores or anything until like november maybe because it's brand spanking new uh and it is it's very interesting so i'll just tell you what it, what it is without saying anything about the plot because the summer here's what i'll say Go to drive through RPG and read the summary of it. It's basically, it's 1998 and it's set on an Air Force base in the U.S. Um, and a mysterious van rolls into the base and then hijinks ensue. Uh, I was like, okay, like the, the brief summary doesn't sound that crazy interesting besides, you know, Air Force and 1998, which is just like a great year for me. I'm like in college. It's like, this will be such a fun thing to, to go back to and reinvent. Then I started reading it and I'm not even exaggerating multiple times. And I, I'll be honest, I never did this with last equation multiple times. I said, Oh my God, out loud while I was reading it. It really is like, Oh my God. Like it's so insane and amazing. And here's what it is. And I was like, what is, what's going on here? And now they sort of summarize it and I'm like, Oh, now I get it. So it's called PX Poker Night, and it is designed as a starter adventure for Delta Green mm. uh, and could be the start of a campaign. So essentially, you make up, you roll up characters that are all in the Air Force. So like they don't have all of the differentiation of the... Uh, um, professions of delta green uh and there's pregens right in the module so if you this is your first time doing it, you want to try it out go ahead and do it but it's basically people that are just in the air force with and it becomes their first sort of exposure to the supernatural in some way or another and uh if you survive this situation on this base you can be approached by delta green and then your like adventure starts it and the reason they time it then in 1998 is because you can start to go through some of the actual operations that are set in 2007 or 2009 or 2015 or whatever you know what i mean you can put, kind of play it that way so i'm not sure if it's something we'll do because it is such a raw like 
you know, beginning a new campaign sort of thing, you know, we can look into it, but I will say, uh, don't read it. If you want to play it, if you think this is something you might be interested in, check it out on drive through RPG. Um, it's, it's amazing. And I wish that I could talk to you guys about it. Once we decide we're 100% not playing it, I'll tell you about it and it's going to blow your mind. But, uh, it, the setting is perfect and 1998 is perfect. Like I'm cool. just saying, yeah, you, I, I can't say anything else about it. Sorry, were you I spent a Grant? decent amount of time at the uh, PX, the Army PX, and uh, near Dallas uh, because my dad is a retired lieutenant colonel. And uh, uh, post exchanges are interesting places because they're basically domestic military bases uh, with like a big shopping center on them. And uh, a lot of times uh, the enlisted uh, members' family are living there with them. So it's like a really interesting setting for uh, a campaign that is very exciting to me. It's very cool. Yeah, it's it's really neat. Uh, it's really, really well done. And uh, somebody mentioned in the chat. Uh, uh, sorry, I just missed it. But they said that it would be that it would be um, it's a really interesting time. Uh, oh, it's Taffy Saint. So in terms of the lore of Delta Green, it's an interesting time in the timeline, which is very true. It's sort of at a time when Delta Green is underground and it's really it's a bad time for them. They've had some bad failures and they're not really operating with any sort of legitimacy uh, it, within the U.S. government like they are at the time that you guys were playing. And this is what sort of brings it back out of the Dark Ages. And they have to start recruiting legitimate people because shit's going down. So uh, uh, anyway, I got really excited about it, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Check it out if you want. And the other thing is, for what's next, is we would like to play more Delta Green, and it has been listed on our Patreon goals. So if uh, you take a look through our Patreon goals, you'll see that even before Glass Cannon Con, if we can hit that 74000 a month number, our plan is to graduate Delta Green out of New Game Who Dis and do a focused Delta Green operation show that might be a really long-running campaign, or it might take more of a form of Last Equation, where it's 12 episodes make a season and it's one operation and then we you know take those characters and do another one or switch out characters depending on what people want to do could be any of those things so that is that let's uh let's open it up to a q a here thank you guys so much for your patience we're running a little longer than i expected but i'm having a great time i hope you guys are enjoying it um Go ahead and throw some in chat if you like. I'm also going to check Twitter. It's a little easier to look on Twitter. So if you want to uh, throw me an at on Twitter and, and send a question, I'll try to pick it up there. But uh, also go ahead in the chat and Grant, Skid, if you guys catch anything in there that uh, you want to answer, feel free to cut me off and answer away. We already had questions coming in hot from Twitter. So I'll go to those first. Um, going to add this one from at the Grace Rogers. Oh, hi, Grace Rogers. Hi. There were a lot of times while listening where I was stressed that the crew wouldn't wrap up the case. As a GM, what plans did you have for it if the PCs failed? And for the PCs, did you spend a lot of time off air planning your course of action? That's a great, great question because it's a nice two-parter. I'll answer the handler part, which was uh, there's really no problem with the PCs failing in this one. And it was going to be a slightly different series of epilogues is really what it was going to be. I was ending it either way. We didn't have any time to continue doing anymore. And so I just kind of had to wrap it up. And uh, and so if they didn't and there were some things that they didn't seal off, but a lot of them they did. It would have taken the form of epilogues. And if all the characters went down or something in some tragic event, that would have been to me. That would have been the end of it. So uh, what about you guys? Did you guys spend any time uh, off air talking about what you would do strategically in terms of approaching the mystery? Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Grant, are you are you gone? Oh, did we lose Grant? I think we lost Grant. We lost Grant. Um, it's all right. There's not going to be any questions for Grant. <laughs> uh, let's, <laughs> let's keep moving. Um, at Draxel asks... Do you see yourself combining other shotgun scenarios with more full-blown cases again in the future? It worked great for this season, in my opinion. Love you guys. Keep up the great content. Thanks, Drexel. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I could see it. I, I want to try to avoid it uh, because it was a lot of extra work, uh, but I think it paid off. I really liked it feeling like everything there was kind of connected. Um, but I think the Delta Green operations do a great job of being standalone, of having a really great introduction and a really great ending to their stories. But if you don't finish the story, there really is something to be said for having that option to uh, to open up again and uh, and uh, and keep 
you know, whether it's bringing in new characters or keep tracking down the same creature that got away or whatever the case may be. I think that to me is just a case of asking the players, you know, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to do one really long term campaign? Do you want to change operations every season? Uh, and then if so, if we finish a particular one and you're not satisfied with how it ended, do you want to continue that story? Um, I don't think that I would have a problem writing Delta Green. I, I don't for you guys. I, I don't think that I could would have a problem with it. So if we finish something and you felt it was left unresolved and you wanted to do a new season with new characters and a new adventure with a similar sort of through line, um, I th- I'd be happy to write one. If we had all the foundation we needed and the characters and everything, I think that I could write one because it just, most of the pieces are already there. You just got to put it into a, a reality and then let the players mess with that reality. Yeah. Um, at Rhapsodus asks from Twitter, if there is anything you can reveal, were there any bizarre twists, trivia, or mysteries that didn't get uncovered in either of the operations? Uh, so I mentioned the Faustus Cloudin and Cl- uh, Clyde Bowman connection in Southeast Asia. Uh, that was a twist or a reveal that never came out. Um, I think one of the other ones was really, oh, oh, here's one that I didn't mention. There's an international incident. So uh, there's one that occurs in Germany uh, where a guy goes on, makes a scene going into the top of a cathedral, famous cathedral in Germany, and threatens to throw himself off of it. And he's holding up a bed sheet that has the number written on it in shoe polish. And he's trying to show it to everybody, and it's getting blown in the wind. So like, luckily not everybody's seeing it clearly in one time. Uh, that I thought was a really cool image and a cool scene. But uh, it just didn't like... I had it on the TV. So if you go back and listen, you'll hear uh, Roger comes to an approaching the house uh, and he is uh, he sees the TV and he sees the flickering lights and, and then he sees the 24 hour news cycle and he sees uh, flashing the flashing lights of uh, uh, of police sirens and stuff like that. That's what he was seeing is he was seeing the this incident uh, occurring and being covered by national news. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to uh, to bring that out because he put on the Godfather. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so I thought about like, oh, the second before you hit play on the Godfather, you notice that, and I was just like, you know what? I'm going to move on from this because we, we had to get stuff done. Yeah. Stuff needed to get done, but I thought that that, that was a fun reveal uh, is that the incident even touches other countries as well, and you start to see the impact from a long distance away. Um, let us let me swing over to Twitch. Did you see any uh, skid that you wanted to answer? Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Yes. I yes. need to jump in here. I don't know if my video feeds back, but... Uh, it's not so quite yet, but... While I was gone, did you answer the Sovereign Glues question about who the woman was in the hallway? No, no, you need that, to uh, know that that is what is top of my mind. And I am so curious. You were like, this is totally screwed up the mission. Roger didn't know who it was, blah, blah, blah. I need to know. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, so that woman is she's just a passerby, but she's a little bit nosy. She's a little nosy about like what's going on in the building, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, she happens across Roger Comstone in the demo. She is actually written uh, in the demo. She is uh, very much so thrown in to just throw the players off. That's really all she's there for. She's there to create tension. And that's what I think Delta Green does such a good job of. And, and with the first module they give you, they just give you one little incident. They're like, here, instead of the media in your face, which is what it is in a bigger adventure like The Last Equation, in this one, it's just one little incident that's meant to throw you off. Did she, was she convinced? Uh, is she going to go talk to somebody? Now, Roger failed all of his roles, and I thought, you know what, this woman is going to call something in too. And, uh, and I ran through that storyline in my head a few times. I had some notes about it in the prep for the new adventure. Eventually, I just ended up cutting it for time. So it, it didn't end up coming back. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, quick question for Grant, because he's also going to have to leave uh, soon, too. This one from Twitch. Sharky in the Tent asks, uh, how did you manifest the perfect Minnesotan out of thin air? And how much time did you spend <laughs> wishing you were at Gooseberry Falls while Googling? <laughs> uh, Sharky in the Tent, I uh, know him and his brother. We have played plenty of games online together. And they are from Minnesota and North Dakota, respectively. They've oh, been a little bit that. of inspiration there. He's fishing. For, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so a little bit of inspiration there, but the uh, second part of it I wanted to say earlier was when looking up FBI films, I found a wonderful film, uh, the directorial debut of the gentleman who wrote uh, Sicario, uh, Wind River, 
um, and uh, it stars Jeremy Renner and the Scarlet Rit- uh, Witch, aka uh, the uh, youngest Olsen sister, um, Elizabeth Olsen, and uh, he plays a uh, Parks and Wildlife Ranger with the weapon I had in there. I added on the uh, infrared scope, but uh, Minnesota really was. Movie. Go ahead. Really good movie. Just. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. everyone should see that movie, and. Um, yeah, so it was just a, a lot of it was just researching Minnesotan things, and uh, there's a lot of great slang. Uh, and we this never got on air, but I talked to Joe. You write down distinguishing characteristics for anything uh, that stands <laughs> out, and I put That's down right. for my resolve or what was it? My will. I your put will, down, your willpower. Right, I put down Minnesota nice as the distinguishing characteristic. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe was like, what is that? And I'm like, it's just the passive aggressive way that they can be nice, but also dicks to people. And that gets him out of a lot of situations. Uh, so, yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, Greg Lito from Twitter asks, did these uh, Delta Green RPG sessions have more an effect, more of an effect on you mentally or emotionally versus Pathfinder sessions? Um, I, I, I think so. I mean, they stayed and like you said, uh, Greg, they, they, they stayed with me longer. I, it was more intense for me. I felt them longer. It felt like the impact was more real. What about you guys? Yeah, I think having it set, not only just like set in the real world, our world, but you know, I, I was talking about it some somewhere else, but genre characters are they in on some level they they know that they're in a genre show Mm -hmm. so they don't react to things the way the normal person would like monsters or ghosts whatever they act to they act towards them normally like a person in a genre show would whereas in a delta green type scenario like you're meant to react to these weird things the way that you would Mm -hmm. with, with the knowledge that these things aren't supposed to be real and so with that kind of atmosphere set up i got even talking about it now, I get creeped out. Yeah. It really spooked. Whereas I, I never really get spooked or I, I do in the moment. Like it's like a jump scare, but it doesn't really stick with me in other games. But this one, like I get shaken in these games. Don't yeah. Me. Totally agree. Uh, two as two ends at Golumbits asks as the handler, what would you like to have a better understanding of for next time? Follow up question: Will there be a next time? <laughs> uh, good question. Yes, I sure hope there is a next time. And for you people, uh, well, there's there's two things. Uh, the rules uh, would be nice to have a better understanding of the rules, especially combat. Uh, but then I think the uh, the lore. I'd like to have a better understanding of the larger lore of the game. I, I kind of move forward without it because we didn't really need it for this. I mean, it was so juicy just dealing with like a multiple homicide based off of a mathematical equation. I was, we, we really don't need the depth of Delta Green history to get into what's interesting or, or it draws you in about this particular operation. But I'll tell you, reading that new one, PX Poker Night, it's like you need to know what happened before in Delta Green and who and where Delta Green is going and uh, I can't even say more. Anything I say is going to ruin this adventure because it has the, everything in it and it's just packed with intensity and uh, and I don't want to say anything. It's a hell of an opportunity, speaking of background research, uh, if we have lead time and we know we're going to reach the goal soon to do what you guys were talking about, uh, having a signed reading prior to, I believe, Jade Region. I believe everyone like read the same book. Mm-hmm. We could all read the same book to get on the same mental like kind of page on how to run the operation. I think that could help cohesion a bit in terms of uh, mood and storytelling. That's a really neat idea. It's a really neat idea. Uh, at Noctum 63 asks, was the second operation supposed to tie in with the first? Also, will Riker's mom's thread ever get revisited? Um, the second operation was not supposed to tie in with the first. I made that all up. And then the um, that tie in which I mentioned earlier. And then Riker's mom's thread is interesting to me. It's something that I didn't get a chance to flesh out. It would have, it, it it's actually has, there's stuff in my notes about it, but Riker never meant, Grant never mentioned it in his home scene. He focused on Maxim and his alcoholism, uh, which is a perfectly fine way to go. I just didn't think he would do that. I thought after finding his mom's stuff, that's all he was gonna spend his time doing. So I fleshed a little bit of that out. It never got into this operation, but from what I fleshed out, I will say I already can see how I could tie it in to like something like a PX Poker Night. So there are other other operations where it can tie in because that tease was very vague and was about a much larger 
uh, and you know, decades long conspiracy uh, that you know. So you could bring that out whenever, whenever you want to. Um, you guys got anything from the stream? I can't. It's away. It's gone now. Uh, oh, okay, I'm gonna go to Twitch real quick again. AJ BB asks, "What's up, AJ? Okay. Listening to the show, uh, uh, Delta Green gave me the feeling it's a lot more." of what you can think of as opposed to what's on your character sheet. Is that how you felt, Skid and Grant? Oh, what? Sorry. <laughs> he asked that the game itself really, uh, it's a lot more of what you can think of as opposed to what's on your character sheet. Did you yeah. feel that way playing it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's one of the things I like about some of the more kind of story driven decision driven rpgs like fiasco you know, we've talked about where it's not as reliant on like what are these numbers on my sheet like me making up that story about the guy in northern arizona i felt like that was something i could do where it's like if you can justify it like we can plug this into the story and have it be real and i love that and there's two different ways like not every game has to be like that and i like that there are different games with different styles but i love doing that um yeah i also loved that um one thing that it gets rid of that can happen in pathfinder sometimes um is um the suggested professions kind of boost up certain skill sets and we all pick different enough professions to where um, both our characters reinforce that, but uh, we also didn't overlap as much. There are times when like multiple characters have like knowledge, religion, or multiple people are like good at disabled device. Um, that didn't overlap at all, and it let everyone kind of uh, flesh out and think like, oh wait, I'm good at that one thing. Now's my time to pop that in here. Yeah, you know, the way that it sort of all went down at Francis Way's house in Keene, I think really showed, and we said it in the show, I think Troy might have said it, to get really showed out, showed how well built the group is for like various situations, mm -hmm. uh, especially when Roger's uh, skills could come to light. Uh, our good buddy Andrew Aguilarian asks, after it worked so well with the NYPD, do you think Sad Cop, Hangry Cop, Sleepy Cop, and Unstable Cop will become a permanent addition to the team's investigative <laughs> repertoire? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that did not go so well. <laughs> and you know what? That ties into another question, which, um, sorry, uh, at PAC asked, not just in Delta Green, but in any RPG. This is a tough question, but. How do you negotiate what silly joke sequences are and are not canonical to the story? Um, as a handler or as a GM, you got to decide on the fly. And but you have a better sense than the players of what will and will not derail completely the adventure. And um, I think the ones that just make it unimaginable that you could possibly continue you just laugh about and then you flash back to what the real scene actually is. In this case though, the, the Guantanamo Bay scene was ridiculous and hilarious, but I was like, this doesn't derail the adventure at all. It just serves to further give the NYPD what they want, which is to hate FBI agents and think that they're awful. And so it really fit perfectly to me into like what they were going for and what would make good story. It and uh, and so I left Stone's, it in. It fits Comstone's character too. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Like doing that. It was really silly. And I, I understand your question and it's hard for me right now to delineate like where you draw that line. But the best way I can put it is like, do you actually have to restructure where the adventure is going to make this silly joke canonical? Um, if you don't, I mean, if you do, then I would just leave it out and make it a flash, you know, that that thing happened. We've done this so many times. And now that I'm like live, I can't think of a good example of where we said this happened. But, you know, it didn't. We all know it didn't really happen. But in that case, in the NYPD, to me, that all, that happened. And it's funny. And it just served to make the adventure even better. Mm -hmm. um, at Pretending Pod, as, oh, Pretending to Be People, by the way, wonderful uh, Delta Green podcast. Oh, yeah. If you haven't listened to it, I listened to several episodes uh, in prepping for running my first Delta Green game. So give them a listen. Uh, at Pretending Pod asks, what was everyone's favorite scene from the story? And what decision would each of you change in hindsight? I'll kick that right to you guys. Uh, did you have a favorite scene from the overall story? And uh, is there any decision you made that you would have changed in hindsight? I think 
I, I love the camera. I love the bit with the camera, like seeing the progression of the photos of seeing, <laughs> oh, yeah. seeing her in the, in the woods and, and seeing like the, her gradually, like seeing the guy taking the picture <laughs> that, that fucked me up. <laughs> but, oh, I'm so glad because as I was writing it, I was like, this is so much better. Like if it was a TV show, you know what I mean? So to write it and describe it, it wasn't, I couldn't, I was hoping that it came across that way. The yeah. build of like her and then seeing, you know, so creepy. Yeah. I, uh, a lot of good scenes, a lot of good scenes though. What would you change? That's good. Anything? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I probably, I would have done the, the spray painting the numbers i probably would have handled that differently mm -hmm. but i don't i don't really know other than and uh, that as my uh thing to change is my last answer before i gotta head out is uh i if i were metagaming uh and playing uh more directly hardcore true to like an fbi agent i definitely would have followed the instructions left by the former delta green agent just to fill the the basement with gas and burn her alive but mm. Deciding yeah. not to do that made the story so rich and gave you all these hooks to tie everything together. So I guess the answer is that all the mistakes I made, I don't regret because I really enjoyed how the story turned out. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I'm telling you, I didn't even think about it until this moment. Your decision to not pour the gasoline down there and light it up killed you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. never thought of that. Never thought uh, of that. And uh, that's why I, that's why I'm also glad like he wanted to save Dr. Westover, but um, it also made total sense because it was his responsibility as like the FBI person who had his yeah. wits about him to, to, to try and do that. It was a, a physician and uh, someone dealing with severe PTSD. So he should have been the adult in the room and like taken operational control. So it yeah. makes sense that his life would be forfeit. And speaking of which, I'm off to go fight a, a ghoul of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks for hanging out, Grant. Thanks, Grant. Uh, take it easy, man. Leave your browser open. Make sure you leave your browser open. Um, so I'm just going to answer a couple quick ones, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, so Arabs asks, Arabs D&D &D and Twitch asks, how would you have handled an immediate character death for Grant's new character had the party killed him? Uh, that is something that didn't occur to me until we were live, and it was happening. And at the moment, you know, I'll tell you, I didn't think much more after it because it ended up not happening. But I was like, this is, it would be great, and he'd be done. Like, there would be no more grand character for the remainder of the adventure. Uh, they, you know, I would have entered into a, you know, a slight like, well, what do you do about this body? And then they would have had to handle the body, which to me would have just been fun in and of itself. And I'm sorry, Grant wouldn't have gotten to play, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, and let's see, I'm going to take one more here and then we got to go. Thank, sorry to people whose questions we didn't get to. Uh, I, uh, I just, there's so many great questions and not enough time. Um, trying to, pick one more here uh let me just do a quick one and manzi at megamans on twitter asks are you surprised there was only one pc death uh yeah to be honest i am i think that uh when i looked at the creature stats and everything i was like this could obviously be a tpk tpk and i think they really could take down two before they really just start running and i think if you really started running it wouldn't have chased you down it would have just left and so um i didn't think a tpk was likely unless people wanted to be heroes uh and yeah, so I, I, I think that uh, I am surprised that at least one more person wasn't taken down. And I think uh, Dr. Lyra Westover would have been taken down had she not uh, had she not rolled to flee and uh, had she rolled to fight. It was a 50 50 and she rolled something that saved her life. One more question from Alan Riggs at Master Rabbit on Twitter. How was playing a game with very little combat slash dice rolling after having played fantasy RPGs for so long? I think it's a great question to end on. Skid, what are your thoughts on that, that uh, on playing that? It's just refreshing. It's just fun to play in a totally different style. It's just reinvigorating. It's, I find it reinvigorating just to do something totally different like that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I didn't know how I would like it, and I can speak for Troy as well. We've had conversations about this after the fact. We absolutely loved it, loved having very little combat. And we're combat guys. We love combat. And we, we loved having no combat. We loved focusing on story and just role playing. And uh, really what we what came out of it to us was that it, it made it so easy to make a more, an entertaining show. It made such a great podcast and such a great show uh, because 
because we didn't have to get into the nitty gritty of tactic tactical combat constantly uh, and make that entertaining. We just had to be ourselves and have a fun time, and that made for what you know we thought was a really fun show. And that's why we want to bring it back. Yeah, I think it's a big re. That's a big reason why it's our, probably our most well received show to date is because of that. Because it's mm-hmm. all about character and role playing, and it's yeah, it allows. A, I think it plays to our strengths in a way that none of the other shows do as as well. We're going to wrap it up there. Thank you guys so much for watching us live on Twitch. Those of you that are here today, we really appreciate you taking the afternoon and hanging out with us. Those of you that are listening on audio, thank you for listening to Delta Green. Uh, Please uh, support that content by trying to get more of your friends to join Patreon. If they're not on Patreon, we'd love to uh, get that number up to our monthly goal of $74,000 a month, at which point we will be releasing regular, somewhat I don't know what the consistency will be, but uh, an ongoing Delta Green show, uh, which is something we we all would love to do we just need to have the time to do it so please uh, help us make that a reality thanks to people who suggested this doing a delta green debrief i'm really glad we did it i had a fantastic time skid i hope you had a lot of fun uh i hope you guys had fun listening and watching and uh, if we can get delta green back up and running with a new operation down the line we'll definitely make the debrief a regular thing if i have anything to say about it so with that take it easy guys this is uh the delta green uh, section of the Glass Cannon Network signing off until we're ready to start another operation, uh, hopefully somewhere down the line. Until we see you again, take it easy, everybody.